Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Shari De Silva, curator of the Jeffrey Bauer Trust Art and Archival Collections. Welcome to this second session in our tripartite series, Conversations Drawing from the Jeffrey Bauer Archive. Over these three weeks, we will speak with writers and scholars across a range of disciplines, including architecture, art history, geography, and urban design, about the Jeffrey Bauer Archives. Our speakers are in fact the contributors to our forthcoming book, titled It is Essential to be There, Drawing from the Jeffrey Bauer Archives, which will accompany an exhibition of the same name, expected to open early next year. Um, in the process of working with our contributors to create this book, I had some really great conversations about the drawings done by Jeffrey Bauer's practice, about architectural archives in general, and about that shapeshifter known as modern architecture. So we wanted to open these conversations up to a wider audience through this series of talks. We must also take this opportunity to acknowledge the vitally important contribution of those who worked on establishing the archive and those who wrote valuable foundational texts upon which we could build, and of course, those who actually did the drawings. We're also immensely grateful to Bawa's collaborators clients and friends who generously shared their experiences and anecdotes with us through a series of oral histories, which formed a valuable research base for this project. And you can access these via our Jeffrey Bauer Trust website. In today's session, titled Resorts, Reports and Recollections, two of our speakers, Shirley Surya and Megal Pereira, each focus on a particular project to discuss the archives. Chanda Daswatha, who worked as part of Bauer's practice, will draw from that experience for his talk. Our first speaker is Shirley Soria. Um, Shirley is a curator of design and architecture at MPAS Museum for Visual Culture in Hong Kong. She's currently working on the opening display for MPAS and a major IMP retrospective. Our second speaker, Megal Pereira, is an interdisciplinary researcher with interest in the politics of public space critical mapping and environmental justice. She's currently working as a researcher for a project by the Institute of Development Studies related to food security and infrastructure provision in an off-grid communities in Colombo. And lastly, we have Chan Daswatha who joined Jeffrey Bauer's practice in 1991 and was the last partner at the firm. Chan is a practicing architect and principal of MICD Associates. He's also the chairperson of the Lunuganga and Jeffrey Bauer Trusts. Our speakers will make presentations over the next 45 minutes or so, and we will follow this with questions from the audience. If you have a question for them, please add it to the Q&A chat box that's available in your Zoom control bar at the bottom of the screen. Please note that this session is recorded and is currently live streamed on our Jeffrey Bauer Trust YouTube channel. The recording will also be available on our channel for later viewing. Thank you and over to you, Shirley. Hello, uh, I shall share my screen. Yes, Shayari. Okay. All right, let's see. This is... All right, um, I'll go full screen. One second. <laughs> go is that clear is it all visible yes okay so i just want to firstly uh thank you um and also jeffrey bauer trust really for letting me be able to really dig into this project um uh, in particular to you know inviting me to write about it uh because i think i've only encountered the materials but having to write about it in about five thousand words like make you have to really consider how do you really want to slice through this project so so I just want to thank you for really yeah, allowing this to be a prism in which I look through many other subjects as well as a wider uh, set of evidence. Uh, and we hope that, um, that yeah, that it, this will just be a way in which we're able to kind of further understand uh, other issues like the relationship between South and Southeast Asia, or even just what does it mean to actually deal with the idea of place or regionalism and all these questions. So I just wanted to, yeah, just wanted to thank you and congratulate you for pressing on with this project through the really kind of a, a bad pandemic so so thank you so i just wanted to uh share that um that this project uh, obviously is something that i encountered uh firstly 
uh, via this this is actually, I think I wanted to mention how I encountered them in a way that led me to write the way I choose to write about it uh, in the essay. So this uh, catalog, uh, Batu, Batu Jimbar Estate Sales Catalog was, uh, was, I mean, the project was already mentioned by David Robson and as well as in Bawa's catalog or monograph, like not catalog, monograph. Uh, but I think, I think apart from reading them, when I encountered it uh, actually in the office of landscape architect in Singapore called uh, Zhang Hua Yen uh, of salad dressing, he was the one who actually mentioned that, do you know about this catalog? Do you know how influential this catalog is and how the illustrations and how the built environment of Bali was depicted really had an influence on him as well as his mentor. And his mentor was of course, Made Vijaya, a uh, very famous uh, landscape uh, uh, garden uh, designer in Bali, Australian as well. And so it's, it's so for me, it started to raise questions about, wow, okay, I guess this influence, even on a contemporary generation of architect uh, is still very kind of a kind of very tangible. And so it raises the question of how something that happened in the 70s still had this trickling effect, something that's done by someone who is not from Southeast Asia, uh, also actually formed uh, the aesthetic uh, ambition of many architects in Southeast Asia and how Bali itself was also shaped. And so the idea, I guess, of like, so who then shape a particular place, you naturally ask the question that there are authors coming from all over and it's much more multiple and multi-directional than just a single so-called local person. Uh, and so that's the first encounter. And then of course, uh, based on that encounter, I, I was also planning for an exhibition on how we see Southeast Asia through the Amplas collections. And thankfully, um, through uh, um, yeah, the generosity of Jeffrey Bauer Trust and Chana in particular, uh, when I visited um, uh, Colombo in 2018 January, it was like, oh, wow. Okay, so these were the kind of materials, the photographs that I saw um, at the office. And, um, you know, it's it's like um, seeing the dummy of the catalog, um, seeing all these uh, envelopes that were meant to be sent to Bali and then back to Colombo. And then seeing uh, in particular for me, it's like the, 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 the working drawings with annotations saying about how the air conditioning needs to be hidden behind you know this wardrobe and all that and also just about and also the research photographs um the study photographs uh by bawa um uh, during his trips to bali and also the slides of the construction and all of this sort of like illuminate um a process about how something like the bali resort uh typology it you know it's often dismissed and trivialized because it's all over the place it's a it's a it's a genre or a type of building that is so commercial you know what's so what's the big deal about it but to consider its conception uh, in the 70s uh, through these materials and at least through the prism of uh, the Batu Jimbar estate, you actually realize, you know, you, you start to wonder like, what is the process that enables someone to look at a place and start to reinterpret a particular type that they see and transmute it into something else? You know, that you actually ask all these questions and these were evidence and that Bawa himself it also demystified the process of Bawa designing. I guess a lot of people think that it's always so, you know, a stroke of genius, uh, very instinctive, uh, not much to study. He can kind of get the feel and that's it. You know, but I think just seeing him um, having these photographs is really a very studied approach. Uh, and of course, there are other accounts that actually spoke of Bawa actually having uh, studied, you know, archaeological sites uh, in Sri Lanka itself, that it's not something that is just completely mysterious and, um, and all just based on a sixth sense, you know, but it's really based on a studied approach. And, and that's something something always encouraging, you know, I think it's uh, encouraging and stimulating for us to actually get into really looking uh, as opposed to just waiting for something to happen. And so that's what uh, I guess the, the encounter with the archive actually led me to, to, to feel. And of course, eventually we included uh, selected materials from this project archive as part of the exhibition uh, in 2018 in MPLAS Pavilion. Uh, and so these are just shots and then uh, you'll see the, the images of how some of the photos were framed, even if it has a little bit of a fungus on it, but we kind of like went ahead to to, to display them. Uh, and so, yeah, it was uh, in the, it was framed as part of a section called Conditions of Place and by someone who is not from Bali, but obviously is very much in tune. But at the same time, it's not just about mimicking a particular thing that they see in Bali, but also, again, I use the word transmute. Um, uh, something else that happens uh, just by observing these things and coming up with something completely, completely just new. So I, I wanted to, I'm not going to go through what I have written, obviously, but I did want to consider uh, the questions uh, that I wanted to tackle through the essay. And so I wanted to bring up the things that have been um, kind of critiqued about the project, uh, Batu Jimbar itself, uh, but also the kind of, I, I find a little bit flawed framing uh, of how projects like 
actually how Baba's projects, even in Sri Lanka or in Bali, or uh, have also have always been framed. So there's this term, of course, critical regionalism, uh, very influential or even faulted or critiqued up to today, but still remain like a framework. And so this idea of the global versus the uh, global versus the local or east versus the west is a very opposition oppositional framework. And so I think my attempt um, uh, to actually again dismantle a little bit of this kind of like polarities. Uh, would be uh, an attempt of a more networked signification of place um, in my essay. I was trying to do that. Uh, and so you will see what I'll be sharing later on that to do with my attempt to really show this network um, of how the project was conceived. It's more than just the architect. It's more than just the person in Indonesia or in Bali, but also someone who's an Australian or from Sri Lanka and a Dutch Indonesian and so on and so forth. And so, and then the, and how it is really much more porous than just a particular kind of like this versus that. And then the second one is about, of course, people all denounced, uh, denounced the idea of the Bali Star Holiday Resort. You'll see this book everywhere as a coffee table book. Uh, and then the fact that the project was like for only rich people is very elite. There's no need to look at it. I don't think so. I think uh, speculative development is something um, that we still need to investigate because it still has a huge impact um, on, on, on what was happening locally. And this is especially in the in the context of, uh, of Bali's uh, touristic development in the 70s, when indeed a lot of the money that actually form what Bali is today is, it, is, is based from expats, is all a very international kind of capital. And so the term here seems like a big word, but it really is about this project as part of a transnational commodity relations of cosmopolitan leisure class. Okay, it seems very big word, but really the leisure class is the elite. Cosmopolitan is the person who flies between all these corridors of Hong Kong, Bangkok, uh, Singapore, uh, you know, Colombo, you know, all these, yeah, a particular group of people, but they made a huge impact. And then the third is, of course, about, oh, you know what, these, these buildings is just a superficial translation of indigenous, of the indigenous, because elites just want to kind of have an intimate relationship with Bali, but still keep their air, air conditioning on. So these are some of the critiques that happen. And so I think for me, I, I, I wanted to tackle these things that seems very pragmatic, uh, dry even, but I wanted to kind of consider these things as part of really how is the tradition of the indigenous actually kind of like integrated while having to create this kind of uh, conditions for comfort living uh, for a particular group of people. So I wanted to look at that. So the term that I use here would be in the veneration of so-called the local, but also its transformation. And so these are just uh, the ways that I have chosen to frame the article. Um, and I will share um, some, just some, again, just to kind of provide a context uh, to the, to the, to the, to the project. Uh, I just wanted to share the idea of network signification here really is about how the project even came about. Uh, so first, before Bawa came into the picture, Batu Jimbar Estate was already planned uh, in 67. And it's by a Dutch Indonesian art collector, developer, Wija Wawa Runtu, uh, and also Australian artist, Donald Friend. Uh, and so in 73, uh, Donald Friend basically, so just a bit of a timeline. Uh, so Donald Friend, obviously, uh, despite his very problematic past uh, and many people have critiqued his work and his life, uh, I think as a historian, we look at who were involved in a particular project and we can look at it, I guess, in some ways, uh, rather objectively of his role. Uh, and so uh, Donald Friend was obviously was already in Sri Lanka for many years and a friend of Bevis Bawa and also already know um, Jeffrey uh, to some degree. And of course, his door was already uh, in, in house number 11 in, in Colombo itself. And so uh, so they were uh, friends and they were also partners in developing an idea of this Batu Jimbar estate for the elite. Uh, because at that point, obviously, there were a lot of rich people, I guess, uh, in, the 70, in 70s Indonesia that really sought a kind of prestige um, and also leisure in Bali. And so the idea of coming up with this development was very key. And so that's how it started in 73. And so at that point, um, Donald was the one who pressed uh, to actually have Bawa to be the architect. And um, and Wija actually visited Bawa and visited Bentota Beach in particular, and was convinced that this is the right architect for this project. And then in 73, 74, it's about two to three trips that Bawa made. And uh, there was also a meeting that was held in Ceylon, uh, in Colombo, uh, that friend actually traveled to. And so this kind of like kind of a you can say, you know, like trans, okay, yeah, it's not just based, it's not just designed or, or made in Bali, but also in this cross kind of like places. Um, and so Bawa produced uh, pretty much individual design eight out of the 15 plots, but he only saw through the completion of two. So it happens out of buildings in two plots, uh, sorry, in three plots. It's a very confusing kind of plots versus houses, but generally they are like a, a couple of houses within a plot. Uh, sometimes it's only one house. So the one I went to is basically two plots. And one of the plot is the one that remained intact in Bali. But then by, by 74, financing lost steam. 
while World War One II started to sell all his uh, every every plot to other people, and then the whole estate actually became a magnet for celebrities. And so even um, David, Bo you know, Bowie actually uh, had a, a unit there. You know, so it's just all these sort of like way in which this estate has been known uh, in Bali up till today. But then something else that I wanted to bring up, which is basically the idea of a Bali, uh, like a resort uh, by the sea, is not something to be kind of like given. So if you see the cover that is in Batu Jimbar Bali uh, sales catalog uh, that is commissioned by Donald Friend uh, for, to an artist called Ida Bagus, uh, Ida Bagus Nyoman Rai, you can see the sea monsters in the in the waters. Uh, they are like, you know, I guess they seem to be kind of co coexisting very well with human beings, but actually the evil spirits were to be known to be in the sea. Uh, and that's how the kind of Balinese cosmology had considered the sea to be something of a trepidation. Uh, you actually have sea gates like this that seem to be decorative in nature, but they're actually meant to be part of temples, sea temples that actually help to guard. Uh, it's, uh oh, is it okay? Or... So yeah, so the idea of the sea gate uh, it itself was actually meant to protect people who are living by the sea. But so I think I wanted to just bring up, and it's something easy to forget, that it is actually the expatriates and the foreigners who come into Bali to actually say that the Bali Sea Resort is something tenable, something even desirable. Uh, and so I wanted to just uh, bring up this lineage of expatriates, beginning from Jimmy Pandi, who's also a art critique and collector, um, whom we Jawa went to encountered as early as the 50s. Uh, that he has a house by Sanur, uh, again, made up of very local materials you can see in the photograph. And then Wija was inspired, oh my goodness, I can also build a house by the sea and a hotel. And so later on, he built a hotel called Tanjung Sari in 62. And Donald Friend also got inspired to build a house after living in Tanjung Sari in 66. So I just wanted to show that this idea of the Balinese resort, even Batu Jimbar itself actually started with the conception of these spaces. And so some of these photographs here are actually of Tanjung Sari, so the Seagate, and even the use of these kind of materials, the use of like um, old doors, antique doors and windows, or even kind of like raising the floor of the Wan Tilan into a two story uh, uh, is, is really already something that they were trying to uh, kind of do, what uh, uh, Donald Fan was trying to do. And so again, I'm not saying that there's nothing new in what Bawa is doing, but I'm just saying that this is the setting and what it was part of, and it was part of that regenerating of, uh, the, of tradition that was already in place. Uh, and so this photo itself, also from Jeffrey Bauer's archive, was I thought it was quite amazing. It's basically Ouija uh, working with someone on a drawing. And then you could see the setting. It's probably one of his uh, villas uh, in Tanjung Sari. You could see the roof and the similarity of that roof together uh, in what we would see in Batu Jimbar Estate later on. And so uh, I just wanted to bring up some words here. Ethnologic, ethnographical conscience, eclectic met methodology, as well as the metropolitan super sculpture, super culture. They seem to be big words, but they are big words. They are words that I'm using to frame who are these people who are developing this project? Who would buy this project? Who would live in it? Uh, who would talk about it? Who would trade it, basically? And it's these expatriates that have always considered that, OK, I think I recognize some parts of Bali that I think I want to preserve, even if it's somewhat something fantastical, but they actually sought, sought to pre preserve it. Eclectic here means that you are able to almost find co-mingling of the air conditioning lifestyle plus whatever that I have or using alang alang roof or uh, the coral stone uh, wall, you know, all these things are, you can, yeah, th this is the, the, the approach that they chose to take. And metropolitan super, sculpt, super, sculpt, super culture here is really a traffic of human, tra uh, human flow, a capital as well as commodity, which belongs across the house is a commodity itself within the very urban corridors of major cities where the, and Bali was part of it. It was part of this major city of leisure for the upper class. And that includes Singapore, Bangkok, Hong Kong. And these three cities are actually mentioned in the last page of the sales catalog uh, itself by mentioning that Bali is actually amongst this kind of network of cities that it's actually uh, not something isolated, but part of this larger larger fabric of urban network. Uh, and so it's it's that sort of a, a positioning again of this project and, and of Bali that I wanted to bring this project to be a part of. Um, just. Um, and also a very important one, uh, this project, again, despite people trying to trivialize the resort, uh, because it was conceived at a time when the Bali Beach Hotel came up. Okay, Bali Beach Hotel was an 11 story hotel. Everybody was against it because it was like, what is this high rise doing in the in the beach? And so when these hotels came up and it's very much endorsed by the President Sukarno, um, we just well, want to actually insist, I'm going to make a hotel in 66 Tanjung Sari that is made of the, of the Balinese village housing compound as opposed to a high-rise hotel. 
And that itself is an oppositional statement to make about not what it means to still preserve the locality and its built environment and not and not just go into another kind of like uh, urban typology that came from elsewhere. So in that sense, you can say that the Balinese resort is like so typical, but at the same time, it was also a conviction of something that they wanted to keep uh, about the locality and whether it's craftsmanship, use of materials, um, relationship with the land, etc. And so uh, I just wanted to bring up key projects that all happen at the same time as Batu Jimbar Estate. This has been written about before. It includes the Hyatt Hotel by Palmer and Turner, Hong Kong based, but it was really the use of these roof again. Again, all these people were all in the network. They were discussing, they were meeting, they were having, you know, drinks and all that. So they were all discussing what does it mean to build a hotel in Bali uh, that is contemporary, but at the same time still make use of all these materials. And so Nusa Dua Beach also involved, uh, designed by an Indonesian architect, Robbie Sularto of Atelier 6. His name is credited as the executive architect for Batu Jimbar Estate. And so he was obviously influenced by what uh, the conception of whatever Batu Jimbar was, uh, was, was, was based on. Uh, working with Bawa. And then later on, of course, uh, we cannot deny that uh, Adrian Zaka, who came up with, of course, Amanusa and all the Aman hotels and engaging Kerry Hill, he himself owns house number, plot number 11, which we will see later on. Uh, he was the first owner. So is this sort of like kind of background about who owns it and what kind of influence came out of who owned these buildings and encountered these buildings are, are part of that local uh, kind of translocal kind of like uh, network. Um, and so I just, so I'll end there for the idea of the locality and its entanglements. But the next one, which I'll go into is this whole idea of veneration and transformation of the, indig of the indigenous um, local, but at the same time, it's part of a porous globality. Glo globality. So uh, again, I just wanted to bring up materiality as any projects that Bawa has done in Sri Lanka is of utmost importance. And so I just wanted to bring up this research photograph as well as this comp composite drawing that is in the catalog about structural features as well as particular kind of uh, materials that are, that are already used in Balinese architecture. So whether it's a bamboo, but largely also brick, coral, tim timber and thatch. And all of these are actually mentioned in Bawa's essay about the project in the catalog. So he's a kind of, a, I guess you can say a respect for all these materials and age old uh, techniques of building uh, something that he had sought to use. And of course, this is already reflected by what Friend as well as Wawa Runtu were doing for their other projects. And so again, uh, this, the entrance, this is an entrance for every pavilion and, and sorry, every every uh, villa uh, is this entrance gate and it has this guardian demon. And again, it's made of paras. Paras is like this uh, a coral stone, but also, uh, also volcanic ash stone. Uh, and then you could see that this photograph um, is, uh, is the use of alang alang roof. But I also want to say that the, the value of the archive, of course, you can see is the process of the design that had changed. And so this uh, photo here at the bottom is a, uh, little bit of an excerpt of how this roof was initially thought to be made and uh, built out of clay tiles uh, and how of course eventually it did not happen and so I would I can imagine that it's got to do with the discussion of what it means to use alang alang roof uh, instead in Bali as opposed to clay tiles and so is the so is that sort of like a, a kind of a decision that's made again based on local understanding but also based on understanding of craftsmanship and so one thing that is very key about having the alang alang roof is also to see see it from underneath and how it has been described as the first order of importance, the aesthetic value of this presentation of the very tightly woven, dense uh, kind of um, a composition of the roof itself. Uh, so this is why it's, uh, yeah, almost all the bedrooms as well as the open story uh, pavilions are all made of the same roof. And so and another, another, another thing is, even if Bawa is kind of respecting local materials, there is this sense of him exercising, at least in my reading, restraint restrained from being completely ornamental or rich, which is what Balinese aesthetic is meant to be. There is a sense of maximize, maximalism, I guess, uh, in terms of using a lot of materials all at the same time. Uh, so I wanted to just use a comparison of a, of a hotel lobby by, uh, which is the Oberoi Bali uh, by Peter Muller, uh, which you could see it was like coral stone plus, you know, uh, the, the alang alang roof itself, you know, it's just all, all you could tell so much detail, but you could say for me, at least when I went to, to Batu Jimbar, it's like this, overriding sense of whiteness uh, that actually somehow successfully even more accentuate uh, the use of all the other materials, whether it's the antique doors, whether it's the alang alang roof or even the coral stone, these kind of almost come out. And even this thing uh, over here, which is like at the bottom of the two-story pavilion, plot 11, is completely this white space that emanates from afar, it's like bright white, and then it kind of draws you in amongst all the other kind of a rich uh, materiality. And so it has that sort of a drawing effect. It's used very strategically uh, by Bawa in its choice. 
And then another thing that is very key, apart from materiality, is really the landscape and its uh, conversation with the land. Uh, and so Bawa is interesting in terms of like mentioning that the land, uh, the house itself has to be stitched together seemingly from uh, within a plot, but also across plots. You'll see in other drawings later on. But in particular, he mentioned about the presence of water bodies within the, within the plot itself. And he mentioned uh, that water is present in Balinese house, which is an interesting kind of a you can say misreading because basically uh, water bodies only exist in palatial grounds. So like the Klungkung over here, or even in temples, like very grandeur ceremonial grounds, but they don't exist necessarily in housing compounds. The particular housing compound in Bali that is like average person is more like this on the right, and it's based on a cosmological layout. And so he knows that like it's it's kind of like, you know, it's a very filtered, selective understanding of what local and what how you want to use it as part of your design. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that it was an interesting kind of like claim about the local, but at the same time, it's also very, very selective on Dawa's part. And it's all largely to do with the kind of like uh, aim of um, really accentuating a visual experience of the entire site. And so I just wanted to show some of these drawings here. You could see particularly the, the elevation and you know, the, the, the section of the entire uh, one plot itself, uh, moving from the entrance gate to the main pavilion, to the two-story pavilion, and then to the pool, uh, and then to the garden and, and so on and so forth. So you could tell here that it's really, the trees are selected based on a particular height as well to actually integrate with the buildings and they don't go beyond or too big in a particular scale. Uh, and so it's that sort of stitching that happens. Um, and then of course, even the wantilan, wantilan itself uh, is instead of being used as something closed, which is usually the case in a, a normal housing compound, it is open. Uh, of course, it was used with bars and like, you know, you can actually have your drinks and all that uh, by the pool, but that's that's how he used uh, the wantilan itself. And these are just some, again, uh, the idea of the plot, the plot or the compound itself accentuated by water bodies, but also the pavements. Pavements are just as important as the buildings uh, that are in the compound. And even within the room itself, it's not a closed room, it's an elongated kind of plan so that you're able to be in one bedroom and you can see through the rest. And so it's that sort of very different kind of plan for a house for residential compound as well, because mostly in a traditional one, it's very close. It's like one use, one room. Uh, and so even being in the upper story, there is this periscopic kind of role of the pavilion and upper story, where you can actually see into the sea and other parts of the surrounding. Very much, I think, like the house number 11, you know, you actually brought to a height so you could see what's around it uh, as opposed to it, because a uh, normal housing compound in Bali doesn't go beyond the first story. Uh, so is this sort of like transmuting? And then the, the part that I mentioned about this pragmatic of air conditioned lifestyle. Uh, so this is an amazing drawing that we couldn't exhibit because it was too many, like in the condition wasn't amazing, but I loved it. I, want, I wish I could include it because it has all the reasons and all the tricks of including all the machineries uh, for comfort living uh, behind uh, the facade, I guess, of the traditional kind of like material. But that's, that's, that's the reality, you know, and I guess all of this is still a very, requires a very skill, skillful integration. Uh, so that's the, what it is. And so over here, the photo on the right, uh, this is underneath this uh, baskets and pots are actually the air conditioning unit for underneath. Uh, and so it's uh, it's just hidden down there and the same goes with this. And so it's this sort of like, yeah, hiding element, you may consider it as very surreptitious, but to me, it's just, um, this is what it is. You know, this is what the, the house is meant to be sold to particular kinds of occupants and particular kinds of, particular kinds of lifestyle. And so you would have to be able to integrate it to, to not make it kind of be so jarring. Um, and so I'm gonna just, yeah. And so almost in my last few slides, uh, the third kind of aspect of this veneration and transformation is really, which makes it very different from all the projects that are in Madurai or even in Sri Lanka, is because he has to contend with a particular typology. And so the bale, the B-A-L-E bale, um, is a, this, two, this kind of like structure that is kind of like one, but it's kind of looks like a two story, but it's not really a two story for living sort of thing. He actually used the ceremonial bale, but the bale that is kind of a bit more humble, meant for storage, into these two kinds of um, two-story pavilion. One is a museum slash gallery uh, for Donald Friend. And so below it uh, is really that gallery. And then on top is still this open upper story uh, that looks out uh, for, for living room. And then the other one is actually more on the right here at plot 11. It's more for living, it's like a dining room underneath and also a living room on top. And so is this sort of like, how do he actually change these kind of, um, uh, I guess, type of buildings uh, that is meant to be a combination of palatial, ceremonial, but also you, almost like, um, storage use, I guess, into these sort of buildings, uh, to me was uh, a really a form of like, a, really a stroke of genius to me. And so again, the, the museum, the museum slash gallery pavilion is really about this grandness. Again, um, you can tell 
that uh, this para stone was actually used to frame uh, the, 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 the defenestration in the windows itself of very severe classic proportion. And then bricks, uh, the one that the red brick is actually the one that actually can create this base, a very strong kind of base. And then the stairs itself, uh, much more grand. Uh, you can see in the other ballet, sorry, in the other uh, two-story pavilion, that the, the staircase does not exist in such a way that you enter from an axis that is within the plot itself. Uh, and then you could tell also the gilded kind of like um, how each of the this forest of timber poles uh, with gilded kind of uh, corners uh, and and how it sits on this kind of concrete base is really also similar to how the palatial uh, pavilions were built. But then this one obviously is really meant to be a house for all seasons, uh, much more you know kind of quieter. But again, how you lead into this pavilion is not by a grand staircase. You actually lead into it by this very small kind of almost tunnel like. But when you turn left. That's when you are able to also actually see um, this stairwell. Uh, this is again looking at from that from that tunnel white stairwell, like almost like a mezzanine level of a lot of built-in kind of seating uh, alcoves. Then you go up again, and then that's when you reach the entire upper story. For uh, then you, from there, you can almost tell similar treatments of how the use of very intricate ornament uh, sculpture as the kind of like a kind of like exil exil points or emphasis uh, for the for the space itself. And then every every a very ornate carving as well for every uh, point of cross section of the of the timber frame itself, and so I guess that's that's kind of like for me my conclusion again I hope I've not exceeded fifteen minutes but it's really about I guess you know it's not so much about uh, kind of like a, a nostalgia or even uh, this is a uh, this building was made uh, or built before the pomo postmodern kind of uh, discourse where the idea of like the, the past or the present needs to come together. But this is really a, a moment of uh, without all these discourse happening, but really just really looking very closely at what you're experiencing in Bali and really seeing how this could be part of this kind of like much more contemporary kind of uh, uh, context, but also a global sort of a way in which in which what is supposedly indigenous uh, could be on par or equal par as what could be a Euro-American type of architecture being kind of like coming together. Uh, as opposed to being very highly self-conscious about about what we need to kind of prove, but then this really natural kind of weaving of both, and so I guess that's how I would read um, I would read uh, this build uh, this project, and of course in my essay I would say a lot more, but I think just simply I, I just wanted to share this. Yeah, please ask more questions later, Shari. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Um, Megal, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, let me just share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yeah. Uh, cool. So thanks for that uh, talk, Shirley. We're moving to a very different kind of project now from elite resorts to public spaces. Also, I feel like I should issue an apology in advance. My styles are not very visually stimulating at all, unless you're particularly excited by typewritten letters. Um, so the chapter I wrote about is about Godface Green. Um, in the anthology. And it's, I'm looking at this brief report on the landscaping and beautification of the Gold Face Green area that was written by Jeffrey Baba. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, Gold Face Green is this five hectare park in the heart of Colombo and it's sandwiched between the Indian Ocean and the Gold Face, the, the Gold Road. And the chapter that I wrote looks at, basically looks at what kind of these initial plans, these unrealized urban designs can tell us about public space, about the politics of urban planning and how they can really inform our attitudes towards contemporary urban development as well. So what I'll do in the talk in this talk is that I'll provide some context for the report some, and then I'll just tease out a few examples of interesting things in the report itself. Now, unfortunately there is no accompanying sketch as well, even though the report came with a sketch, the archives doesn't have it, still looking for it. So if anyone on this call has it, please let me know. Uh, so in April 70, in April 1978, Bawa is uh, invited to be on a subcommittee for the landscaping and beautification of the Gulf East Green area. Now he's invited by none other than Prime Minister Premadasa, who is also the Minister of Local Government, Housing and Construction. So Bawa sends his report to the committee, but he also sends a, a copy of the report to President J.R. Jaiwadana. Now this image here is the accompanying letter to, to the president and he says, and I quote, I take this opportunity to send you a copy too, as I know you are interested in restoring our city to some order and beauty. And I think it's really interesting that 40 years ago, we are still 
or 40 years later rather, we are this, this, this twin elements of order and beauty continue to inform our approaches to urban development and continue to dominate the discourse around it. But I think that this UN, so this UNP government that, has, that came to power in 1977 came to power and they were pursuing this, that is just before 1978, and they came to power pursuing an agenda of economic growth and neoliberalization. And these, in pursuing these economic policies, they invariably and intentionally shaped the city to meet the demands of this agenda. So in 1978, we have the establishment of the, which is the same year that this report is written, we have the establishment of the Urban Development Authority, a new government institution that is, is basically going to rebuild Colombo in collaboration with the private sector for the first time. We also have the, the, final, the Colombo Master Plan, which was funded by the UNDP in this, in 1978, it's finalized. And it suggests a complete restructuring of Fort and Peta, which are the areas that are adjacent to Golf Face Green. So the, this area around this urban park is going to change massively in the next few years, right? It's going to be restructured as a central business district, and it's going to cater to international capital. It's going to try to attract foreign investment. But at this point, particular point in time, it's a very different space. In fact, the, old, the parliament building actually is right next to Golf Face Green. But in, in the next few years, when the capital, when President J.R. Jayawardena, the recipient of this letter, shifts the capital from Colombo to Sri Jayawardena Purakote, we will have a new parliament, and this new parliament will be designed by none other than Jeffrey Bauer himself. So in this context of kind of rapid urban change uh, that is also like fueled by economic imperatives, I find Bava's report uh, really a breath of fresh air because what he's, he's, his approach is quite cautious. His approach is also quite conservative and he's really almost looking to, to, to keep the status quo rather than create like a really transformative change to this space. And I think this is best encapsulated in his quote from the report where he says, I do urge that we do not do anything piecemeal in any piecemeal way as Golf Face Green always has been and always will be the most important space in Colombo. So the reason that he has such a glowing recommendation of the space and the reason this space is so important to Bawa uh, is partly because he think because of its views and that and the views that it affords the general public as well. So he says again uh, in the very second paragraph of the report, he says, from a tomscaping point of view, it is the only place in Colombo which is widely open to the sky with no trees or buildings infringing on the whole arc of the heavens. It is also the only place where one can see an unhindered long view of the horizon and the sunset. Now, uh, temporary or uh, contemporary uh, visitors to the park will note that we do not have this luxury anymore of an unimpeded uh, sunset for obvious reasons. But at that time, it, 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 it seemed to be something that Baba really thought was important. He also is interested in the, the kind of the freedom and that this public space affords people. And he's really invested in, in ensuring access and, in, and keeping this sort of free open space for everyone to use. And he says, in, I mean, in the very first paragraph, he says, the green itself can be left absolutely free and untrammeled as it has been for so many years. It can remain an open wide grassed area for the people in Sri Lanka and the people in Colombo to use in as free a way as possible. And I think it's really interest, it's, it's interesting that He's really talking about preserving this space for the people, ensuring that they have access. And he's talking about a very light touch to public space, one that is based on like unregulated use and freedom and enjoyment rather than maximizing economic gains of a very, very valuable waterfront property, which Golf Face Green really is. Uh, so, and I think that promoting access and enhancing views are these two threads that run through the suggestions of this report. Remember, it's a very short report. It's only four pages, but, uh, and I'm sure that every architect and designer is familiar with this attempt to balance aesthetics and function, but so obviously sometimes there's a tension between these two things, right? Because the very utilities and amenities that make the park more user-friendly often come at the cost of preserving this beautiful unbroken view of the sea that Baba wants to maintain. And many of the suggestions in this report are actually attempts to negotiate between, negotiate the tension between access and, uh, and views. So for instance, he says of the seating in the park that he, he that each seat, the, the backs of the seat shouldn't be higher than two feet and six inches. He's like, he says that the, the lighting and the promenade should be, should be obviously there to make it safe and agree, agreeable, but it should be shaded in an easterly 
direction so it minimizes visual disturbance. He also has this really interesting scheme for the toilets where he wants them to be, in his words, virtually invisible um, so that they're accessed only, they're actually put under the promenade of Golfes Green so that they're accessed from stairs leading to the beach. Now, for some reason, the committee actually the, rejects the toilet proposal outright, and I'm, I'm not really sure why. But a proposal they do, the proposal they, they do take on board at the next meeting is his tree planting scheme. So Bawa is, at the time, the, the existing plan suggests that there are these 16 ornamental bays of planting that, are, that should be put around the perimeter of golf face green. Now, Bawa is appalled by this. He says it would be an utterly wrong thing to do to make these little bays of planting. He says, because obviously they obstruct the view. Instead, he suggests that tree planting only take place on the eastern side of the Gaul Road. So that's like on the Gaul Face One Taj uh, side of the Gaul Face Road. And if the tree, and obviously every trees, the trees that are selected must be sensitive to climate and be able to withstand the sea breeze. So again, we see that site is playing a key role in his in his practice, and he's designing with the environment rather than against it. And I think this is the centrality of site is something Shari has already addressed in her previous previous talk. So even though the committee agrees to Bava's proposals for seating and tree planting, by November, according to the correspondences, it's clear that the plans have been adjusted and in some cases just disregarded. And the final plans are not approved by Bava's office. At least that's what the correspondences suggest. And I think it's interesting that these elements of the plan, like trees, like seating, almost function like mental landmarks, no pun intended, allowing us to trace urban change across time in a particular space. So the modern park user or the modern visitor to golf face green will inevitably make a comparison between what is there in, the, in, in this paper plan of the past and what is present in the concrete and stone designs of today. And I think that it, in making this comparison, we are actually asked whether we like what we see in the first place. So, uh, and I think that, so the reason I think that these records matter, even though, and that this report matters, even though most of its proposals were not even built. I mean, I think it's, it really matters beyond intellectual novelty, right? Because there are these values, there are these ideas, approaches to urban space and urban living. And these are really frozen in time in this report. And it's up to us to excavate them and interrogate them as we see fit. Now, this is not to suggest that Bawa's plans are perfect or ideal that they should have been implemented 40 years ago, or that like today we should implement them and go to golf face green, remove all the coconut trees to appease the ghost of Jeffrey Bawa. Rather, I think that the value of these documents comes from the fact that they are counterfactual. They present an alternative future that was urban future that was imagined 40 years ago. Uh, and I think that this in itself is valuable, a valuable contribution to our urban imagination as citizens of Colombo. And I think that it also challenges, it also shows that these trajectories of urban, urban development aren't inevitable and neither are the values or the ideologies that inform them. So to conclude this talk, I'd just like to end with Baba's conclusion to the report himself, itself, where he says, the main thought underlying all these suggestions is that golf is green as it is now should remain open and free as it always has been. And that whatever we do to improve it should be done with great discretion and in sympathy with its age-old ambience of a public open space with a wide range of views. Thanks. Thank you, Megha. And over to you, Chandler. Shani, you just need to unmute yourself as well. Yeah. Um, how do I share my screen? Uh, it's the button at the bottom channel. Yeah. Um, and while Chandra is sharing screen, I'm just going to remind all our listeners that you can um, add any questions you have as our pre uh, presenters speak in the Q&A chat box at the bottom. And here we are.
Right, so this evening I am going to speak about uh, something very, very different to what Shirley and Megal spoke about. They sort of spoke about some specifics that you can find in the Jeffrey Barber archive. Uh, but mine is more a sort of uh, thought about all of those things. What are those drawings? Where did they come from? What was it like to be in the process of making those drawings? So I'm kind of saying, I've called it drawing stories from the Jeffrey Bauer archive. Because in many ways, um, drawing in the Jeffrey Bauer office were not just one thing. They were an intention first, and then they were a record of reality. In the Bauer office, it was never a final object or instruction to simply follow on site, but always allowed for accommodating the views of those who were implementing those instructions to put in their little bit as well. So it made sure that the architect was giving a sort of intention but never really a specific instruction because the instruction itself often came on site. And hence, uh, Shari's interesting uh, selection of uh, the title to this book and perhaps the exhibition, it's essential to be there. So in the process of the very drawing was this necessity for the architect to be there. One, to be there consciously uh, in the location itself, but also to be there in the history and the place in which this architecture was actually happening. So the drawing was really a sort of uh, a, a tool by which he actually began to think. Uh, and I remember once I was in office and I had, I think, drawn one of those um, drawings that we were making for, uh, I remember it was the Bintan project. It was one of those projects that had developed from the Bali project that, uh, that Shirley was talking about. Um, and I had drawn, you know, the same drawing for about the fourth time. And I, I was really quite irritated and went to Mr. Bawa Jeffrey at the time and said, you know, what is going on? You're asking me to draw this for the 10th time. Of course, it's, it wasn't easy then because it was all pen and ink and you had to scrape drawings when you did it the third time. Those sort of erasers didn't work. And then he said something very, very interesting and revealing because uh, to me, uh, I kind of, you know, I was an assistant, I was educated, I had a master's in architecture and so on. And what was I doing, doing the same drawing for the fourth time? He actually said something very interesting. In that moment, uh, he kind of said, if he had a way of conveying into the mind of the person who was building this building, what he had in his mind, he would really have no use of architectural assistance or any of us or even my drawings because the drawing was the tool through which he was beginning to think, clarify his ideas, and then send that instruction or begin to share those ideas with a third party. So the drawing was a process of clarification of something that was in his mind. So it wasn't something that was ever going to be the perfect object. It was, also, it was always going to be a work in progress. So all the drawings you find in the archive are in fact, things like that, their works in progress. And as Shirley would probably find out if she looked at those drawings that she has been studying that is from our archive um, and now uh, uh, in the collection there, um, and then look at the reality on site, there might be discrepancies. And that's because the drawing is a work in progress. So these drawings, which are very, very interesting, are really about thinking. So in many ways, sort of this relates to those ideas about the thinking hand that you find spoken of by Johanny Palasma, and uh, I was reading a book recently called Draw in Order to See by a man called Mark Allen Herritt, who says it is through drawing that the architect actually sees. So you have something in your mind and then you begin to see that for the first time as a work in progress in your drawings. Now, this of course is not the same as the primary role of other drawings that we have today. Now, if you look at most of the drawings that um, you, uh, so, so if you look at this particular drawing here, uh, and this is a drawing done a little before me uh, on the left hand side uh, of the screen is the Jeffrey Bava sketch of a house that was done on Park Street in Colombo. And on the right hand side was a drawing and of course the house was built uh, uh, long before I joined his office. In fact, a few, a, a few years before I built, joined his office. But the drawing on the right hand side was draw, drawn long after the building was done. And most people would probably be familiar with the drawing on the right hand side. And this of course is not in the usual Bava style because there was a gentleman in office who was actually had a particular style of drawing which uh, Jeffrey rather liked. And he said, well, why don't you draw this? And 
This is the drawing that was eventually published to uh, illustrate the, 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 that particular project in a, in a wonderful exhibition we had in Australia um, that, um, that, that, that Jeffrey Bauer had with a, with, 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 with a little catalog that was published. So you have the Bauer drawing, which is an intention on the left-hand side, uh, or a series of thoughts about what you might do on a site. And then you have a drawing, uh, and there's really in the archive, nothing in between. Then I know there's one drawing, which was a letter written to the client with a sort of semblance of what we have on the right-hand side. So it's kind of a process that you see in the archive, which is always very, very interesting. Of course, what the Baba uh, office shares with other architectural drawings is that drawings are in fact instructions. And if you look at this range of drawings I'm showing you, there are a whole series of different kinds of drawings from vellum on the left-hand side, which is taken from outside of the collection. But all the other drawings are actually from what was the Bava archive. Some of it, of course, are in my personal collection now, because as I'll tell you later at the end of this uh, short conversation, the archive was never expected to survive. And the three drawings of the altarpiece for the same church that was done by Edwards Riedenberg before Jeffrey Bauer's time, one pencil on, on, on drawing paper, ink, uh, watercolor on drawing paper and ink on tracing were actually for uh, a church in Colombo. Uh, which was part of the archive, which I sort of collected at a time when it was not going to survive. Uh, and below it uh, is a blueprint, which is also another mode of presenting drawings, um, which was made of, of an ink and on tracing drawing that I had done uh, with Jeffrey for a interesting project that we did uh, in Bangalore. And of course, the last drawing that you see is a, is a, is a, is a computer rend rendering of the Bento de Beach Hotel, which was used recently in the renovation of the hotel. So all of these are different ways in which you give instruction. And what's interesting about a drawing is that it's more than just what you see in it. It tells you something about when it was done, why it was done, how it was done, and the society within which it was done. So archives are very interesting, not just simply for the content in it, but also for what it actually is. Archives are also, I think, uh, modes, uh, drawings are also means by which you actually disseminate a lot of information that is not really architectural and meant for construction. So for instance, if you look at some of the early folios of drawings uh, that uh, were made uh, in the 18th, 17th and 18th century here, uh, this particular Tutelier architecture by Sebastian Serlio, you find not just records of old buildings that were in Rome that architects were drawing at the time, but also imaginary drawings, drawings that could be reassembled for other options that you might have uh, from what you were studying of an old building. So drawings not became not just instructions, they were not works in progress as well, but they were also possibility. And when I think about drawings that were done over the years by various architects, and then if you look at these two sort of drawings of Piranesi that are in the Bava collection, uh, these two prints, uh, they're all sort of, are they real? Are they not? Are they imagined? And in many ways, the Baba drawings were really, uh, uh, were, were, were all of that. They were instructions, they were works in progress, and they were also imaginations. Now, this particular drawing, this blueprint that I've come back to, is a drawing that is done over a plan of a ruin of an old fort outside of Bangalore. Unfortunately, uh, the expressway to the airport has cut right through this beautiful building now, and it doesn't exist except as a kind of sectional drawing. In fact, it looks like one of these sections now when you drive from Bangalore airport into town, uh, you actually see it cut in half. Uh, but in this, we were imagining how this family in Bangalore was going to live in this place. And you'll find very, if you look carefully, I mean, this is very, very small, but there's even a sculpture that we found in their garden that was drawn into this drawing to say, look, that's where you would arrive, but the guests are not supposed to come through there, but this sculpture would be used in this way. And, and it was a complete imagination of suspended beds from columns and, and all of these ideas that came to Jeffrey at that time was actually embedded in the drawing. And in this particular case, unfortunately, um, the, the project didn't happen. Uh, as I said, the, 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 the monument itself has now been sort of cut into a section 
and doesn't exist. But what we do have is probably, this is probably this imagined drawing uh, of this monument is probably the only real record there is of this beautiful, probably uh, 17th century monument outside of Bangalore. So archives become very interesting because of the way we layer ideas onto what is already there and then begin to, and then of course the building goes in a, in a di different direction like Megal's golf face has gone in a totally different direction, but the drawing says what that alternative possibility might have been. Now, this is another very interesting drawing for me because these were the first drawings that I came across in the Baba office because I joined him just when the Kandalama Hotel uh, was just about to be built. And these drawings were really the only drawings that we did in the office. There was no more detail than this at this scale. And then we did one-to-one -one drawings of details of every room. So this was the instruction. This drawing was the instruction given to site. And of course, there are, there's hardly any information on it except the key information about where the rocks were, where the key trees that the people on site had to save. And I remember the tree that's quite close to, I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, there's a tree marked there that's always been on every drawing. And when the building was being built, Baba was on site and people had piled rocks around this tree. And I remember it was midday, just about to stop for lunch. He said, absolutely not, no one's stopping for lunch until the rocks around this tree are cleared. Because this was one of those that was in one of the drawings right from the beginning and right to the end. And so sometimes these drawings will tell you stories about what mattered to the architect. Everything else was jungle as far as, as it was concerned, which was going to be preserved. This was going to be inserted into the jungle. And those elements that were so close to the building had to be preserved. And those were the instructions that were on these particular drawings. In another case, Jeffrey kind of, again, was drawing this story. Now, this drawing is one of my drawings, it's not a Baba drawing, but the drawing is a result of a story Jeffrey was telling me as we went along. The client he had never met, he had only spoken to her, he had assumed what this client, who this client was like, and he told, and the, and the house is, is, is built around a story of Jeffrey visiting the client and how he would come up this pathway, go through a great entrance, come into a gravel court, crunch, crunch, crunch would go the tires of the, of the wheels of his car, which would park in front. He would climb up a few steps. Staff would come from the left-hand side. Immediately the staff areas were, were designed around that area. So this drawing is actually a result of a conversation. And then it was originally drawn on a flat site because he assumed the geography of that area was flat. But when we went, it wasn't. And then it began to modify itself. Uh, and the story began to lengthen and how these bastions would grow up to hold up this house and into the bastions would go the staff quarters, the gym, the, 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 the spas, all of these different things would come up uh, as part of an extended conversation about a story that was being drawn. And then eventually presented to the client as a drawing. So here was a story that became a drawing that then became an architectural proposition to a client who then, in the way Bhava presents it, the client falls in love. Falls in love with the ideas, with the drawing, and of course, with the story of a possibility of a lifestyle. And that's really what these drawings were about. They were about conversations, they were about ideas, they were about how you would go forward uh, through a, a series of ideas. Now, this is a classic collection of drawings. It's one of the few things that I think Shari has in her archive, which shows us the stages which develop from a mere pencil sketch on the very left-hand side to something in the middle that's kind of halfway in between. And then you have the published drawing on the right-hand side that was done for the book, the white book uh, that, um, that was published in 1984, 85 uh, of the Triton Hotel. Uh, and, and what's very, very interesting, of course, is all of the scribbles that are going on, because all of this is part of the conversation that's going on around the drawing. The drawing is not setting, the drawing is never sitting on a draftsman's, a draftsman's uh, 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 drawing board. It's actually flat on Jeffrey Bava's desk with layers of other tracing paper and masking tape on it with 
layer after layer of conversation happening on top of each other. And then eventually there is a design uh, that by some means is transmitted to site and then a drawing that is done after the building is built, which you see on the right hand side. And now these, the, the tradition of course goes all the way back to Lucky Selenaika and this particular drawing, um, which is very interesting because Lucky's drawings of intention are really very fragile, so we can't actually even show them. But this particular drawing signed by Bhava in 1962 was done really in 1985 for the book, the white book, uh, because the end product was, as far as Bhava was concerned, a pretty important object. It represented the building that was on site. Um, all other drawings were works in progress, except the ones that were built after. So in many ways, the, the drawing in, in, in Bhava's office was not something that was ever going to be completed. And that's very much like some of his own buildings. They were always works in progress. Now, these are some images that I'm showing you of the Kandalama Hotel, which is very close to my heart because it was the first project I worked on. And what you see on top is the intended elevation, which kind of even has tiled roofs on top of it. And this was, I think, a drawing done by one of my colleagues, Nilshan Ferdinando, uh, to present to the client as the first set of drawings. In fact, it was the set from which we saw the plan earlier. And then the photographs that you see below is on the left-hand side, the black and white, taken by me uh, sort of in about 1993, soon after the hotel opened. You'll see it's sort of quite stark and that's where all the criticism came. And, and I remember Jeffrey kind of reminding me, but they don't have the patience. And I didn't understand what it meant because I thought, yes, this was this wonderful mesen sort of, you know, modernist building that Bhava had built. But of course his whole intention was that there was going to be an ongoing transformation. And what you see in the sub subsequent pictures, one taken in 19, 2007 and the other taken in 2018 is the eventual growth of that vegetation around that building. So in many ways, his drawings were also works in progress like some of his buildings. And in many ways, uh, the, the con conclusion of a lot of those, 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 those buildings are also in the case of the Kandalama, Jeffrey once said it was when the, the bears were living in the rooms and the leopards walks the corridors would Kandalama eventually be finished. So in many ways, the drawings are sort of a, 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 a process that eventually the buildings take over. And for me, one of those memorable moments was when Jeffrey was ill uh, with a stroke. I managed to, uh, my, uh, and some of us managed to take him to Kandalama. And this was about four years after he had actually um, uh, finished the project. And I remember pushing him along a wheelchair down a corridor um, and, and then turning a corner. And he put his feet down from his wheelchair, stopped. And he started crying. And I thought, oh my God, what have I done? But of course I realized he was, and then he started pointing to the end of the corridor. And I had realized that all the plants had started growing and he had finally seen the object that he was seeing in his mind, even before he did this first drawing. And eventually he's expecting the hotel to virtually disappear and become nothing. And this photograph taken in 2018 shows the hotel really halfway, if not halfway, more than halfway through to what he thinks that final object might be. So in many ways, the, the archive tells us stories about the processes that he intended, which were then sort of conveyed to people who built the object. And then of course the object continues that process of ongoing transformation uh, that will eventually uh, either become or continue to fall apart as part of that process of building itself in, in his mind. So for me, uh, I learned rather quickly uh, from him that if the, the, that the drawing was really only a part of a, of a much bigger process. And that's why I think uh, in many ways, preserving the archive for him as well, because it was only a work in progress was really the last thing Baba wanted. In fact, preserving anything was perhaps not part of his being. Sitting on the terrace on the last evening at Lunuganga, on which I was able to actually talk with Jeffrey Bauer, uh, he kind of looked down on the, on, the, on the gardens and said, look, if anything should happen to me, I just want you to cut the grass on the top terraces and we can watch the jungle take the garden back. So in many ways, I don't think he was, of course, this didn't happen, 
the trustees kind of kept the garden going. Of course, he enjoyed the garden as it was, and we now share it with visitors, and they come to contemplate its peace and grace, which is what makes the archive even more important than ever. It was not supposed to survive in its present form. By its very survival, we now have an opportunity to contemplate on the origins of some of these buildings that Baba and his associates caused to be built and the cultural ethos within, uh, ethos with its multiple inspirations from which those ideas arose. All the more reason for this particular examination of the drawings and stories that are embedded in it and left by an architectural practice that was working in a very fast changing world to forge a sort of identity to an ancient nation state at the crossroads of history and looking to a future of contradiction and complexity. So I think the archive is very, very important because it wasn't supposed to survive. And that in itself is something, a sort of gift that I think we have. And I'm really, really glad that everyone who's working on the archive, who's interested in the archive is writing such fabulous things. Uh, Shirley's great insights into Bali and Megal's wonderful insights. And of course, everybody else who will be talking at the next talks, Sean Anderson, Jyoti Da, all of them have wonderful insights into what, what in many ways is what I would like to call the accidental archive. And Shari, you're in charge of that. And I think it will be, it's, 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 it's great what you're doing. Uh, and, and thank you for what you guys are all doing to look at uh, what has survived from these processes of things. Thank you. Thank you, Chana, and thank you to all of our presenters for these really um, wonderful and insightful presentations. Um, I have a lot of questions. I think perhaps the audience does too. So I'm going to invite you, uh, we already have one, which I'm going to um, take in a second. Uh, but just a reminder to anybody who does uh, want to ask a question, just to uh, drop it into the Q&A, which you see um, as a chat box at the bottom of your Zoom control bar. Our first question from Gek is for Shirley, and it says, uh, did Baba bring any Balinese artifacts and artworks back to Sri Lanka? I think I would forward that question to Chana and Shayari. <laughs> 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 you know, like, cause I think, yeah, something in the house that you would know about that I don't. <laughs> so, I mean, there's so the, yeah. the famous piece would be the, um, the tapestry that you have in number 11. Yes, the tapestry is a whole collection of those wonderful hand-painted uh, drawings that you uh, kind of, you, you, you still find them, in, in, uh, if you can, if you're very lucky, uh, in where that wonderful water pavilion is. Uh, Shirley, where is that, uh, that wonderful pavilion that's in the water? Uh, I can't right. remember. Uh, so it's the Klung Klung Kung, the palace, the judges' yeah, pavilion. Exactly. Right. And I think he collected a whole lot of beautiful hand-painted drawings uh, from those shops that you kind of find uh, and, and maybe he even sort of uh, engaged with some of the uh, the makers of these these drawings because uh, he must have used them in Bali. I've also seen a couple of small uh, carvings. There's one with a, with a boat that you find at Nunuganga against one of the windows. Um, uh, there's also, isn't the, the fish mobile that's hanging in his bedroom? Mobile, yes. I don't know whether that's in Bali. I think it's Balinese made out of uh, palm leaf. Yeah. Um, ordinary mobile, I think. I mean, he said it was Balinese to me. I don't know. I can't remember. But he did bring quite a few. And I think uh, the fabrics, which he then uh, fixed onto a canvas and made an entire wall, which is about uh, almost 20 feet by, by 12 feet high, uh, mm -hmm. is, is a spectacular backdrop to his sitting room in, in number 11. Right. There you go, Gexri. Uh, I hope they answered it fully. <laughs> Um, I definitely think it's interesting how um, in we, I mean, you know, Shirley, you, you told us about um, a project that's quite far from Colombo, but he always found these ways to kind of weave those places back. You know, I think the relationships that he built between Sri Lanka and um, even Colombo and other, pro other places was always kind of reciprocal, um, the way objects get placed and then they move. Um, we have another question from Tai, uh, and he says, what were the key climactic solutions that Bawa implements in all his works, which he learned from Bali to Sri Lanka? Um, thanks, Tai. Shirley, do you want to? Um, 
yeah let me let me let me try to okay climatic right so that's the key one so obviously i think um the use of the i think the whole well I'm, 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 now i'm trying to like come up come have this comparative hat in my mind uh, which i only touched on very little in the essay so to do with like this open pavilion right so meaning like the open pavilion in um in uh, in bali not just about views but it's really about air um, and um, and I, I, it was also about the house, the house itself being an elongated plan as opposed to a square closed house. It's also about the views, but also about the air. You know, it's about the openness of the inside outside is similar, I think. But then now I'm trying to think about how in Colombo is that similar. It may not be as, okay, you guys can correct me because I've only been to, again to, you know, four, four buildings. Um, and I find, but I think, so I think it's it's not so much there's more of a courtyard kind of a sense uh, within Colombo I find um, it's like a yeah so that openness of the inside outside is more within that setting but within Bali it's much more much more open to the environment it's not so much enclosed within a courtyard there's at least a difference a similarity but also a difference but of course materiality itself is a climactic choice as well you know why do you use why do you emphasize the roof why do you use alang alang it's got to do with what you consider to be how the rain comes in. How the water drops, you know, and from through the roof into the ground, you know, all these things are possibly similar as well. So, I'm sure you can talk, uh, share more about about the climatic kind of strategies for the buildings in Sri Lanka. I think they are similar to me, but yeah, but maybe the strategies are slightly different. The techniques. Anything you want to add to that, Chana? Well, I think I mean it, it, it's both ways. I think it goes both ways because if you if uh, um, Shirley pointed out that in fact. Uh, Vijayavarantu came to Sri Lanka and saw the Bent of the Beach Hotel. Uh, and that's very interesting because um, it was one of those hotels that uh, changed the way um, we looked at things. Uh, mm -hmm. He actually designed bedrooms that were not air conditioned initially. And we know through my interesting uh, process of rebuilding the hotel uh, that there were some things that happened. For instance, the windows were made smaller and window air conditioners were fitted later on. Um, and, and so on. So the original design in 1968 uh, actually was for non-air conditioned uh, rooms even. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, the, 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 the lobbies were, were open pavilions uh, mm -hmm. on the lower level where the wind blew through. So in many ways, it would have been, uh, we just sort of looking at this architect who was already beginning to connect with uh, the local environment, with the climate and so on. Uh, and, and of course, being able to, as again, as Shirley pointed out, very cleverly hide all those sort of international sort of requirements of a cooler room and so on uh, in an interesting way, which he begins to do at the Ventura Beach Hotel. Uh, so so, uh, so I, I, I feel very strongly that it's, it's because there already were connections in the way uh, Jeffrey Bauer was responding to climate uh, through his buildings in Sri Lanka that convinced uh, Vijay Bauron to, to, to ask him to come. Uh, he could have used Peter Muller, I suppose, at the same time, but he chose Bava because I think I, 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 what I hadn't realized, of course, is that wonderful comparison, Shirley, you made between the whiteness of Bava's buildings uh, in 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 in, in uh, Sanur and 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 the rather sort of busyness of the Oberoi, uh, and and you could quite imagine again uh, that that was that probably interested uh, Vijay because that's what you see at the Bento to Beach. You see uh, Bava using those magnificent batiks by Ina de Silva against the whiteness of the walls and the whiteness of a terrazzo floor. Uh, so you're kind of contrasting the richness of, 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 of traditional decoration, but giving it space to breathe. And, and that perhaps is a, is a huge contribution that Bava made in the way you begin to use uh, traditional material. I mean, I mean, also what she did in Osaka. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Chan, but it's just quite exactly. <laughs> 1970, in the Osaka Pavilion, which uh, I don't think we are going to talk about here, but hopefully we'll have reconstructed at the exhibition that Shari is planning, uh, where he contrasts the richness of the batiks with just a glass box. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that gives culture space to breathe. And I think uh, that, that probably attracted them as well. So there were these two things of climate and whatever. Of course, Sri Lanka, the materials are different. Alang Alang is not usually used. We, use, we used to have paddy, uh, paddy roofs, uh, rice, rice, rice stock roofs, but mostly in tiles uh, by the time Jeffrey was working. And so 
there were slightly different strategies, but yes, uh, there were connections. Um, I think we have time for one last question. And if no one puts, I'm just going to ask a question of um, really the three of you, because I know you were all researching or you were, very, you know, this was work that you were doing when we invited you to engage with the archives. And I think that in different ways, you've all sort of spoken about the way um, the archives maybe shed light on something a little bit differently to what you were, how you were approaching your study previously. I was just wondering if you might just speak a little bit more and especially, I mean, that central question that we are investigating both in the book and the exhibition, which is really, what do the archives tell us about these places, given how much I think each of your presentations really said this, you know, you describe these kind of granular attention to place and what place might be um, at a very detailed level. Um, so I was just wondering if you might each want to add a um, little bit to that question. Maybe, um, Megal, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think that looking at the archives, uh, yeah, it's been, first of all, this idea of unbuilt environment and looking at how these things that didn't, these projects that weren't realized can tell us so much about idea what people in the past thought of the future and what we and how they can inform our urban imagination that all comes from looking at this archive because uh, i mean my previous research hasn't really uh, kind of delved into it but i think that especially just reflecting on using the archives and what it means about studying places uh, firstly i feel like doing archival research just raises more problems than it solves actually um, which can be quite frustrating but I think what I realized is that it's it's kind of also just a material repository of just information about places, but it's also bound by the constraints of of its time, right? So there are there are limitations. So for instance, uh, this absence of a plan that really really frustrates me, or the absence of that sketch. Uh, when I'm reading the correspondences between Bava and various people in government at one point he actually says um, you'll have to ask somebody else for the plan because this country is very short of printing paper and I've only printed one set so I mean I guess it's also about just like the limitations of archives in studying places as well right it can only go so far yeah Shirley would you like to yeah I, I just want to agree Mega to say that it's um it's both a very kind of um, very rich figures, but I think real archives are always fragmented. And because it's fragmented, uh, that's why it's also um, kind of uh, provide uh, very non-static meanings. Uh, and it still requires us to, I mean, again, it depends on the kind of questions that we have about what are we investigating, right? So you would, so for me, I'm almost like, that's why I needed to go to Bali <laughs> to see the buildings themselves, because I know I can't write about this essay just looking at the archives. Um, I didn't know whether I didn't know how much change there would have been in, in a design uh, today, but at least one of them was still intact. And so, so we know that uh, again, it's a, I think who I think Megan, you you do it. At the archive is counterfactual, right? Somebody said yeah. that, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I guess another fact to always counter the archive as well. You know, so it's just I just to me it's it's a very important source, uh, and I think like what uh, Chana had said as an amazing insight into the process of things, especially when they are completely like completely working in progress and and so that has to be tested with another source uh, and so for me and also the archive can be very subjective so meaning that it comes from a particular point of view whether it's you know because it belongs to the Bauer you know estate and from the team you know I don't know what the client thinks let's say you know and so I don't know how it's consumed by the by the client or by the, by the consumer whoever, whoever that is or the, the user so I, I I personally am interested in this multi Kind of like dimensional view of how the building is, is used or, 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 or mediated but that's why I think it's wonderful that the archive also contains this catalog which shows us how the building was sold right and so it's more than just how it's designed but also how it was communicated so again uh, I think I think there's a lot of surprising value to the archive but depending on what we are trying to read uh, it's always going to be requiring us to find out other sources to kind of put it, set it against the archive yeah. But I think one thing for sure about the archive that is really to me is is really the letters, uh, Mega. What yeah, you're for me, interesting is the letters. 
Uh, to me, one thing about the writing of Bawa uh, is always precious, you know, because you're always wondering, you know, what does he think, you know? Chana, you have the privilege of being with yeah. him, you know, encountering him, having all these anecdotes, but then for those outside, you know, what is he really thinking, you know, what does he mean by this? And so having his text, uh, all these letters mean so much. I think I'm not saying that we, we should still uh, view them critically, but it's still a huge, it still illuminates a lot. Um, and so we could also uh, sense the consistency, you know, like uh, of values or approach across different projects and how he writes. So that's, that's what I think is the value of the archive. But for me, it's of course, uh, the, the, the value of the archive uh, will always remain because um, of this ideas about what a building might have been and what trajectories it actually took. Uh, and I think, as I call it, the accidental archive, of course, has all of these as it is, it's, a, it's fragmented, it's not a complete story, uh, but I think it never was meant to be a complete story. Mm -hmm. what, what, what was left was really a, a, a series of works in progress uh, that, that we have. I think the, the next big sort of revelation in the archive would eventually be when we managed to, uh, perhaps Shari and her team managed to uh, open out uh, the letters, the letters that we have to give a look at. Uh, and there's a whole lot of them. Um, they're not, again, they're, 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 they're probably fragmented because not everything would be there. Uh, the later later conversations that we had over Kandalama and so on, uh, I know that each of the letters were typed. I remember typing them. I think those are in files. So there might be some very, very interesting things that even I don't remember about the hotel that would be in those letters. Uh, that might maybe even contradict what's in the drawings. Mm. Because as I told you, there's a whole sort of gap between the, uh, the ongoing process drawings that, that we kind of see in the archive and the final drawings that are published. So that gap perhaps is something um, that um, we might find in some of the letters that we could find in the office. Uh, and that might tell us a, 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 a few more things about it. But as, as Shirley said, I mean, the key things about this work in progress drawings, but they were also the ones that were used to sell the story to the client. So it was this story that was drawn and then uh, taken along. And it, it, it's really about storytelling. I mean, you had to, to convince the client with a, with a good story. And, and the drawings actually helped in that process. Today, I think they, they, you, know, you, 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 you do sort of very uh, sort of realistic 3Ds and so on. But in those days when you didn't have, you had 3Ds, you could do you know, watercolor 3Ds and so on. But Jeffrey Bauer didn't, in the, didn't indulge in those. He told stories through, through drawings, through plans, sections, and elevations. And he used them as a tool to, to supplement the story he was usually telling uh, himself. Uh, so in, in many ways, he's, he, he was a great salesman. He was able to speak and convince clients and convince people. Uh, uh, and, and the drawings were an aid to that. The drawings were an aid to, to telling that story uh, and convincing a client to, to part with their money to, spare, to, 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 to build it. Uh, and I think that that's really uh, an interesting part of the, and, and, and what those stories are that sold the buildings would be what's interesting uh, uh, in, in, in finding out in those archives. And Shirley, of course, uh, I mean, even I didn't know Shirley until you, we pulled it out for you that the, the market for that actually existed. And that was an extraordinary find. Um, and, 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 and similarly, uh, think of all of these drawings as, as aids to telling a great story and, mm -hmm. and convincing people that it's worth building. And as far as Bawa was concerned, it was really some of those ideas that he desperately wanted to build. And another example I take is that when I, you know, when I started working on the Kandalam, I thought, what a fabulous idea the bathroom in the front of the room was with a view from the, from the, from the loo pot. Of course, you go through the archive and somewhere in 1973, this idea has been put to some client uh, for a hotel in Kandy in Mahakanda. And the client didn't buy it, obviously. And it went into the archive. It just went into this series of drawings and, and got piled up and so on. But in Bawa's mind was this idea. And when the next opportunity came, he comes and recycles it. And he manages to sell it to Aitken Spence board this time. And they build the Kandala. So I think it's very, very interesting to see all those connections in an archive. Where, how far has an idea traveled? 
mm. uh, in an architect's mind and in an office. And those are very, very interesting things. And then what were the alternative possibilities and what have we missed? Again, like Megal said, I don't think one is more precious than the other. Uh, the past is never better than the future or future is never better than the past. But at least the knowledge of it means that we are going into the future with knowledge of what might or might not be. So the archive, I think in that way, helps uh, us to inform ourselves and people who are interested and perhaps even people who matter and who make those decisions for the future about what might have been and what, uh, uh, what, 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 we, what we may have missed or not missed out. Thank you, Chandler. Um, I think unfortunately that's all the time we have today. Uh, Mega, Shirley and Chandler, thank you for taking the time today to share your research with us. Um, just a reminder right. that this is the second session of a three-part series, Conversations Drawing from the Jeffrey Bauer Archives. We hope to see you next Thursday for the third and final session uh, titled Maps and Modernism with Jyoti Da and Sean Anderson. Um, you can find more information on our website, which is jeffreybauer.com. Thank you, everybody, and have a good night. Thank you so much. So good to see you all. Thank you. Good to see you as well. All the best. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.